final item of business is members' business debate on motion 15454 in the name of Graham Simpson on housing through the lens of ageing. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Graeme Simpson to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I'm really pleased to uh, be able to open this debate on housing through the lens of ageing. The title of the report, which has been co-produced by Age Scotland and the University of Stirling. And can I thank members across the chamber uh, who signed the motion in my name, uh, particularly my good friends, uh, Monica Lennon, Andy Whiteman, who's uh, otherwise engaged, and uh, Kenny Gibson, whose uh, uh, seniority uh, gives him a special interest in the subject. <laughs> how, how can we, as a society, better prepare for and meet the housing needs of an aging population and what role does the home play in the quality of life of older people? These are the questions tackled by the report. The number of people aged 75 and over is projected to increase by 27% uh, over the next 10 years and by 79% over the next 25 years. That gives us uh, a clear set of challenges. Helping older people to live independently and safely in their own homes for as long as possible is what we'd all want. It's better for them and it's better for strained public services, but it requires investment, be it through funding adaptations or care and repair. And both areas are struggling. We continue on this road at our peril, and I'll say more about each later. Three key areas or themes where improvements are needed emerge in the Age Scotland research. These were integration, communication, and community all of which are intrinsically linked. First, integration. A lack of integration between councils, health and social care providers, service users, and everyone in between leads to confusion, poor management, ineffective strategies and systems, and ultimately an inferior housing situation for older people. There are a number of areas which still require to be addressed and improved. The best way of finding out what older people need and want is of course to ask them and we need to recognize that everyone's needs are different. This becomes more apparent as people age and are more likely to become frail, vulnerable, disabled or develop long-term health conditions such as dementia. As the home is where people spend most of their time, a holistic person-centered approach that allows health and social care to work more seamlessly within the housing so sector and older people in their homes is crucial. That's why I was pleased to see another research project, Housing and Aging, Linking Strategy to Future Delivery for Scotland, Wales and England 2030, presented at the Scottish Futures Forum last week. The conclusion of that piece of work was to place housing at the heart of service integration. Housing provision and support for older people is beginning to become integrated with health and care support needs, but it's a confused picture. Within social housing provision, issues remain, such as the lack of wardens within sheltered housing, the lack of choice in smaller rural areas, and lack of targets for age-friendly properties in planned new developments. Early intervention and the development of preventative measures, such as adaptations and energy efficiency measures, remains key to all of this. Second, community. It's imperative to consider not just the buildings themselves, but also the external environment that the homes are in. The surrounding community, uh, support networks, nearby amenities, transport links, and everything else that makes people feel part of a community when they're not at home. New builds and age-friendly design, downsizing, public transport, accessibility, and the urban-rural divide. They're, these are all issues that older people are concerned about. I want to turn to the positive contribution which is made by care and repair services. While care and repair services are largely looked on favorably because of the tasks they're able to assist with, there's another less obvious benefit to having a handy person attend someone's home, and that's the social connection. The availability of care and repair uh, and handy person services should be consistent across councils. There should be no postcode lottery 
but there is. It's a game of chance. Last year, we lost care and repair in Inverclyde, West Lothian, and North Ayrshire. The previous year, we lost South Ayrshire. Uh, it looks as though the service in Angus is under threat. Care and Repair Scotland told me this week, the formation of IJBs has not made our lives any easier. The Act transferred funding for owner-occupiers disabled adaptations to the IJBs. However, there is still a great deal of confusion about roles and responsibilities. Third, communication. Many older people cited uh, a lack of knowledge about where to turn to or who to ask uh, as a reason why they hadn't sought advice uh, in areas of their lives and homes that they needed help with. Now, onto the recommendations. Um, if I can turn briefly to three of the six recommendations contained in the report. Uh, the first, the planning process should be reviewed to ensure an adequate supply of different types of housing across all tenures. There's a planning bill going through Parliament, so we can do this. The second, people should have greater clarity about how to access the range of support and information services available. Uh, and the third area is adaptations. These were highlighted as one of the main areas that supported people living at home for longer. But in 2018-19, housing associations outlined the need for £16.9 million of funding to provide adaptations. The amount available was about £10 million. That figure has not increased in the past six years. It's something the Local Government and Communities Committee has repeatedly highlighted. We need action. It's a timely piece of research given the challenges we face as a society. It supports the growing evidence base of what older people need and want. It captures examples of good practice and innovation, and it reminds us of what actually works. But it must not gather dust. And perhaps this debate will help to ensure that it doesn't. Thank you. We move to the open debate, and I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to congratulate Graeme Simpson, MSP, on securing today's debate, allowing us to discuss Age Scotland and my alma mater, the University of Stirling's important report, Housing Through the Lens of Ageing, Integration, Communication and Community. It's more important than ever for Scotland to be a good place in which to grow old. According to National Records of Scotland, around 20% of our population is aged 65 or over. In my North Ayrshire constituency of Cunningham North, that percentage is even higher. The Scottish Government has already improved the quality of life for older people in Scotland with its most recent strategy on housing for older people, the Self-Directed Support Act 2013, provision of free bus travel for over 60s, and of course, free personal, care and free personal nursing care. However, we must go further to support older people to live independently and safely in their own homes for as long as possible. <clears throat> That's why I welcome Age Scotland's excellent contribution to achieving the six key policies identified in the Scottish Government's Age, Home and Community, a strategy for housing for Scotland's older people. Age Scotland's report provides insight into how to improve delivery of strategic planning, information and advice, adaptations, housing with care, preventative support and new housing. With over 75 years of experience in supporting older people, Age Scotland is perfectly placed to constructively uh, advance the debate around the role of housing uh, and improve quality for people in later life. The report also features a case study on the development of lifetime homes in North Ayrshire, a priority for North Ayrshire Council. The scale of the new build programme is ambitious for a local authority of its size, with plans underway to build 1,732 new high quality affordable homes by 2023, backed by £102.218 million from the Scottish Government. Given North Ayrshire's rapidly ageing population, it is increasingly important that new homes are suited to the needs of older people, and indeed a quarter are. Half of this specialist accommodation will allow the Council to provide homes for those most vulnerable and in need of support. Examples of the lifetime homes approach include St Bayer Gardens in Millport, with 12 bungalows built around an attractive and accessible shared outdoor space. 11 homes have been constructed to amenity housing standard, while retaining the flexibility to be adapt adapted further for those with more significant disabilities. The 12th is fully wheelchair accessible. Phase two of this development next year will see a further 10 amenity homes and five wheelchair user homes built. 
The project will be an exemplar for energy efficient, accessible older people's housing, setting a benchmark to inform future older people's housing. Only this afternoon, I attended the official opening in Bede of a refurbished Dixon Court, where 22 older households live independently in sheltered accommodation, following an investment of £2.2 million, including £1.2 million from the Scottish Government. Given these advancing years, uh, Graham Methuselah Simpson has already put his name down on the waiting list. Another exemplary North Esher project is the Dementia Demonstrator property at, at, at Montgomery Court, Coburnie, which I visited. Of the 90,000 people in Scotland with dementia, 2,571 live in North Ayrshire, and Age Scotland emphasises the importance of dementia-friendly housing. The Dementia demonstra Demonstrator features specialist design, such as contrasting objects, walls and floors, to make them easier to see, floor coverings with large patterns to avoid unsettling shiny surfaces, clear signage positioned below eye level to indicate the purpose of the room, and extra lights to create brighter spaces. The outdoor space is designed to be attractive and peaceful and pass a level and e easy to navigate. These small adjustments are easily applicable to traditional or existing homes and make a difference to people living with dementia. In exploring North Ayrs as a case study, Age Scotland suggests taking forward the principle of weighting new build towards older people and dementia friendly design. Reducing fuel poverty is another housing element we must prioritise going forward and I'm sure they will welcome the fuel poverty bill which myself, Mr Simpson and other local government committee members have worked on to ensure it meets the needs of Scotland's most vulnerable groups and communities. And a report on the bill will be published at midnight today. Presiding officer, I'm confident Age Scotland's excellent report will feed into the Scottish Government strategy through the Age, Home and Community Monitoring and Advisory Group, of which Age Scotland is a member. And with this approach to understanding and, and analysing the needs of older people, I believe we can achieve our aim of supporting all older people in Scotland to live safe, healthy and independent lives at home for as long as possible. Before we go further, can I issue a warning to Mr Simpson and Mr Gibson in that I am older than both of them? So please be very, very careful what else you say. <laughs> Jeremy Palfer, followed by Pauline Mee. Um, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I uh, thank the older members of this chamber for allowing a young gun into this debate um, at this stage? Um, this is um, an important debate, and I think it's actually very helpful that it follows on from a debate that we've just had earlier in regard to isolation and older people, because often isolation and housing um, can be linked. Um, as my colleague Graham Simpson has pointed out, uh, we live in a, an ageing population. Here in Edinburgh, 20% of the population is now 65 plus. But I do think, um, as with often in, in government, whether it's national government or local authorities, there is often still um, a concept that we look in silos rather than looking across broadly. Because in my experience as a, a former councillor, housing was often left out um, of the debate around health and social care services. It was something that was left to a different department or a different team. But I think we do need to have a policy about ageing that puts people who are older in the right place with the right networks and the right environment. And that's why I welcome very much uh, this joint report uh, by, the university, by Stirling University um, and Age Scotland. Because if the housing is not in the right place, with the right, perhaps, transport links, um, the right um, accessibility, then the housing is simply not a home. And I think there's a difference between a house and a home. A house is bricks and mortar. A home is somewhere that we feel comfortable, safe, and secure in. And we should all be striving to make sure that older people have that home. Um, I, I do welcome uh, the moves by the Local Government Committee, uh, perhaps um, with some amendments around the planning bill that's going through at the moment, that has looked at what we're going to do in the future uh, for older people. Uh, and I think those amendments, um, although maybe may needing some tidying up and some clarification, are showing where the Parliament does want to go and setting the scene uh, for development in years to come. Because too often, housing or homes um, are simply an afterthought 
uh, for all the people, or simply somewhere that can be put in. And I, and I do hope local authorities, as we go forward with planning, whatever the amendments are by the end of the time the bill comes through Parliament, do take that seriously. As people get older, um, they do need adaptations done to the house. And I think there is a challenge, again, for local authorities around this area. Um, often bed blocking is taking place because for older people uh, to go back to the house, they need, they need these adaptations done. And often they are waiting months for it to take place. And I think this is where the third sector can work together with local authority and with government in giving these services quicker. Uh, I'm sure most of us are aware of Care and Repair Scotland, which not off only offer advice, but assistance in regard to putting in appropriate adaptations uh, to a house. Sometimes these are, are very small, but without them, the person can't get back into the house. And so I do hope that both uh, national and local government will support both uh, Care and Repair Scotland and, and many of the other organisations that work across Scotland to do these repairs. So I think this report is helpful, but I think uh, Graham Simpson is absolutely right. If this simply sits on a shelf for the next few years and gathers dust, then it will have failed. And the challenge for us, both in government and out of government, is to take this forward and make real differences for older people. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Pauline McNeill, followed by John Scott. Presiding Officer, um, sincere thanks, first of all, to Graham Simpson for bringing forward what I think is a substantial policy debate, and one that I hope in time will actually have a full parliamentary discussion on, but also thanks to Andy Whiteman, who chaired a packed out uh, cross-party group on housing, where we discussed the issue of ageing. So we've heard from Graham Simpson and other members that the number of people aged 75 and over is set to increase by a staggering 85% in the next 20 years time. That's a big number. There are big numbers in this debate and that tells us that it has huge implications for the design of our housing and social policy. So we must ensure that people are able to live safely, independently in homes designed for an ageing population for the needs of that individual including support service that they need to live. I want to talk for a minute about renting into retirement because this is an area of ageing that scared me when I read it. So the number of people renting into retirement is on the rise. So one in eight retirees will be renting by the year 2032. It's a significant extra cost. And an increasing number of retired people will have to find whilst not working and on a low income. The term generation rent is often applied to young people, but increasingly it's becoming applicable to pensioners. If you are taking into account the need to pay rent into retirement when they plan for their life after work. So we must encourage people to recognise and understand the financial implications of renting into retirement. And we've got to take action now because more than a quarter of renters are under the age of 45. And that group don't see themselves ever being able to be in a position to buy a property. And for those who have to get into retirement, the estimates, the estimates are that 42% of their retirement income will be spent on their rent. The average renter will need to save something like £525 a month on top of their pension contributions to afford this. So you can see this is going to be a huge problem for many people. And that's if you consider that the recent benefit changes and universal credit will make this even harder for some people, particularly those uh, who retirees who have a younger partner uh, right now. So those age 65 living in a couple can claim pension credit regardless of their age. But from the 15th of May, those couples will only be able to begin to claim if both partners are over the age of 65. So it has substantial costs for those couples, which are estimated to be about £7,000 a year. So we need a lot of change here, and we need change to the housing market as well to ensure that it better suits older renters. Homes for Scotland point out that new build homes, including those for private sale, must meet a wide range of accessible requirements, such as adaptations that Jeremy Balfour talked about, barrier free access to homes and spares and lifts. And I have to say, I think we're a long way really from the planning system um, actually ensuring that that happens going forward in terms of the number of houses. Yes, I will. Yep. Uh, 
Kevin Stewart. Ms. Ms. McNeil, for giving way, and a lot of what she's describing is not so much the planning system, but the building standard system. Um, she can be assured that uh, we will look at all of that, but does she recognise that a huge amount of effort on the part of government committees as well uh, as government, it's, uh, on parliament committees as well as government itself has been on dealing with uh, post-Brexit scenarios because we could not be complacent uh, around about building standards in that front? Pauline McNeill. Yeah, I'm happy to recognise that the government are not at all complacent about building standards, and I think what I'd really like to get across in this debate is I think we need to go a lot further to make sure that if we're serious about adaptations and people living independently, we're going to have to be a bit more radical, I think, to make sure that that happens. According to Homes for Scotland, um, almost three quarters of the stock built before 1982 does not have the features that we're talking about here. Um, so we've had a lot of talk about uh, downsizing. I believe the correct term now is right sizing. I only learned that today. And that's to make it easier for older people to move into smaller homes. So we need to be able to plan for that, a high range of high quality options for older people. I had the opportunity to visit Fife uh, last year to look at the quality of their sheltered accommodation and it actually genuinely surprised me. Um, what it shows, I think, is that the quality of social housing in, the, in this sector is possible to build um, sheltered accommodation, which is highly desirable, and that has to be the standard across the country. I have to say, in closing, presiding officer, I, I was very grateful to the um, local government committee for supporting my amendments for local authorities to have regard in their development plans to dementia-friendly homes and, ex and those um, who need um, uh, access for disabilities. Sally Witcher from Inclusion Scotland said, Scotland's next generation of homes will be without adequate floor space for many disabled people being unable to buy or rent sufficiently accessible homes can leave people disabled and trapped. I think in conclusion, there's a lot to be done in this parliament. I think there's a lot that we can agree on, but I do think, I hope we can agree that we need to think for the next 20 years to deal with the aging population, we need to be a little bit more radical. Thank you. John Scott, followed by Lewis MacDonald. Well, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to speak in this timely debate on housing and ageing and congratulate Graeme Simpson on securing this debate today. And the recent research carried out by Age Scotland and the University of Stirling show that fuel poverty and energy efficiency were key areas of anxiety and worry for older people. I therefore wish to focus my remarks on domestic energy efficiency measures and the positive link which these can have on, aid, on improving the health and well-being of the people receiving them, as well as helping to tackle one of the key drivers of fuel poverty. And one of the key features of this report is the attempt to capture good practice and innovation across Scotland in order to demonstrate what works. I was therefore delighted to learn that the groundbreaking work which is taking place in Ayrshire and further afield involving the Energy Agency and NHS Ayrshire and Arne is to be showcased in the report when it is published and already mentioned by Kenny Gibson. And the report carried out by the Energy Agency in partnership with NHS Ayrshire and Arne is conducting an evaluation project to investigate the potential benefits of solid wall insulation. The study commenced in 2014 and has now become an ongoing monitoring and evaluation project involving over 350 households to date across South Ayrshire, East Ayrshire and Dumfries and Galloway and has enabled an analysis of the impact of the council-led local area-based insulation projects to be undertaken. And what this report shows is that the energy efficiency measures carried out can have a positive impact on health. These include improving housing conditions, increased indoor warmth and comfort, and reduced fuel bills. And health questionnaires issued before and after the insulation works have indicated improvement in both physical and mental health for those who also perceive their homes to be much warmer following the insulation works. There have also been anecdotal reports of improvements to existing health conditions such as COPD and asthma and reports of improved mood following insulation. And the findings so far have been impressive, whether it, is, whether it be in relation to the condition of the property, fuel costs, or thermal comfort. 
Turning now to property conditions, over 9 in 10, indeed 94% of respondents agreed that the overall condition of their homes had been improved by the insulation. With regard to fuel costs, respondents reported average fuel bill savings of around £250 per year, equivalent to 23% of their fuel costs. And the fuel poverty rate fell, and the number of properties with a below average energy efficiency rating decreased from 49% to 21%. With regard to thermal comfort, 88% of respondents agreed that their homes were able to retain the heat more efficiently. O over 7 in 10 of respondents, indeed 78%, reported the overall temperature increased following the insulation work. And the study is also examining longer term health trends in postcodes where wall insulation upgrades have taken place. Clinical data such as hospital admissions are now being investigated in order to compare areas which have received the measures with a control group of similar postcodes who have not yet participated in the scheme. Presiding officer, this Age Scotland report is a serious and robust piece of work. It is exactly the type of evidence that we need to inform the development of policy in this area. This project has highlighted the benefits of including a public health perspective in the evaluation of domestic energy efficiency improvements by capturing the actual real life experiences of the occupants. This is something which we should all welcome and I thank Age Scotland for highlighting it in this report. Thank you. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. And I too congratulate Graeme Simpson on bringing forward today's debate. We do indeed need to adjust our focus to look again at housing policies and priorities in the context of a growing older population. Much of our existing housing stock in both public and private sectors has been built with young people and families in mind. But we know that future demand for older people's housing will only go up. Existing models like sheltered and very sheltered housing, as we have heard, remain valuable, but new models will also be required in the age of health and social care integration. So I want to focus my lens in this debate on one particular new model, which has been developed in my home city, indeed the minister's home city uh, of Aberdeen, and which has been showcased by Age Scotland and the University of Stirling in the report we are debating today. When I took on the role of convener of the Health and Sport Committee, a year ago, I soon discovered that the integration of NHS provision and local authority social care was moving at very different speeds in different parts of the country. I had ministerial responsibility for that process of integration between 2005 and 2007. But despite continuing commitment to it from successive governments, there is clearly still some way to go. I also discovered last year how far Aberdeen City Health and Social Care Partnership was held up as an exemplar for others to follow. And it's good to be able to highlight a specific aspect of that in this debate. Delayed discharge can happen for a variety of reasons, but the most common is that there is no suitable accommodation or care package available that would allow a person no longer in need of continuous health care to leave hospital. Aberdeen City Council has converted what was sheltered housing at Clashy Now in Bridget On to provide interim housing and support for people who are either due to leave hospital or struggling to cope in the community. Clashy now has 19 interim housing units catering for adults over the age of 18. Now, while many of the residents are older people, this is also one of the few services which already support people with complex social care needs who are under 65 years of age. Intermediate care and support are provided on site by the council social care provider on Accord Care. Residents are enabled to learn or relearn skills necessary for daily living from cooking and cleaning to independent mobility and medication. Key to the success of Clashy Now is mutual trust among housing, social work and NHS staff with effective partnerships among Aberdeen City Council, Bon Accord Care and the Health and Social Care Partnership. Another partner is the Disabled Persons Housing Service, a local charity based in Aberdeen, while the Delayed Discharge Housing Liaison Group, the Housing Needs Assessment uh, team and the Adapting for Change project group have all also played important roles. Aberdeen City Council have also launched interim housing for people with low-level support needs in both Cove 
and Maastricht in the city, recognizing that future provision must span a broad spectrum of needs, abilities, and disabilities. Intermediate care and support, of course, cost money, but they cost a good deal less than delayed discharge does. Initial findings from the Aberdeen project suggest that interim care costs are something like half the cost of a hospital stay. Delayed discharge is a challenge not just for the NHS, but also for housing and social services. And I would commend the good example of Aberdeen. A person-centered approach, open lines of communication, and regular meetings of all concerned are key to success, and a health and social care partnership with the vision to know what needs to be done and the clout to get on and do it. Thank you very much. I now call Kevin Stewart to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Um, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm not going to mention age here today at all in terms of any members. I think that would be uh, the wrong thing to do, and I certainly uh, don't want to, to face your wrath, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, and I'm very surprised that you're older than Mr. Simpson and Mr. Gibson. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'd like to, to thank uh, Mr. Simpson uh, for highlighting this important issue. Uh, the thing is, though, that the, um, there's a, a wee bit of confusion here because Mr. Gibson was talking about the fuel poverty um, report being published at midnight tonight. It was midnight last night. It's published. Um, and the, uh, through the Lens of Ageing report has not yet been published in full by Stirling University. Um, and I, I'll be most interested to see um, exactly all of that and what that encompasses. I'm aware that it recognises uh, many of the issues identified in our refreshed age, home and community strategy. Uh, and the Scottish Government's vision is for older people to enjoy full and positive lives in homes that meet their needs. And the three principles uh, that we think will help achieve that vision are the right advice, uh, the right home and the right support. Um, so it is reassuring that the data gathered uh, and analysed by the University of Stirling validates the importance of appropriate housing advice and support for Scotland's older people. And as many of you know, um, Age Scotland is one of our key partners, and indeed it was uh, Age Scotland's offices in August uh, that I launched our Refreshed Older People's Housing Strategy, Age, Home and Community, the next phase. Uh, and during my visit, I took the opportunity uh, to visit Age Scotland's call centre uh, to hear firsthand uh, the requests for help from older people and their families. Issues with housing, health and heating uh, come up on a daily basis. And I'm pleased to say that this government has always prioritised tackling fuel poverty, offering assistance to vulnerable households struggling to heat their home. And I would make my usual appeal uh, to members at this point um, uh, and suggest that if they know of any constituents who have any difficulties, um, for them to get in touch with uh, the Home Energy Scotland advice line, the award-winning Home Energy uh, Scotland advice line, uh, which does an, a, an immense amount um, to help uh, refer people uh, to the right agencies to get things right, including um, the energy agency uh, which Mr. Scott mentioned um, in his speech. Uh, last May, I was invited to speak at a, a University of Stirling-led event, along with Rebecca Evans, the then Welsh Minister for Housing. Uh, the resulting report, Housing and Ageing, Linking Strategy to Future Delivery, confirmed what we all know, um, that there is still work to be done to address housing and ageing, not just in Scotland, uh, but elsewhere in the UK too, and right across Europe. Uh, here in Scotland, uh, we have worked with COSLA and other partners in health, housing and third sectors to review our original age, home community, and community strategy to better reflect the changing needs of older people. Uh, as well as building on existing actions, the Refresh strategy seeks to address the issues of isolation older people can face and improving access to suitable housing. And it was interesting to hear from members today highlighting current good practice. Uh, many of the topics raised today have actions within uh, the refresh strategy. Um, for example, um, the importance of local care and repair services. And I agree with members who have highlighted 
care and repair services here today. And it is disappointing uh, that some local authorities have called back in the delivery of care and repair. And uh, I note that Mr Simpson said that um, we should try and create uniformity right across the country. But there is that balance to be struck because the government itself is often accused of centralising. Um, I would hope that local authorities would see the benefits of care and repair uh, services and conti continue to fund them. Because in the long run, funding these services will actually save them money as well as stopping some of the human costs that there are uh, if those services are withdrawn. I'll give way to Mr Graham Simpson. Simpson. Thank, thank the Minister for giving way. Um, has, has, he, uh, has any analysis been done of um, the, the savings that can be produced by having uh, services such as care and repair uh, and indeed a fully funded adaptation service? Kevin Stewart. Off of the top of my head, I don't have an answer to Mr um, Simpson's question about particular anal analysis has been done, um, but I don't have particular answers. What I would say is from my own experience and from talking to OTs, uh, occupational therapists in Aberdeen on a constituency basis just the other week, um, you can see quite clearly um, that spending on uh, adaptations as well as improving quality of life can have a saving to councils, to integrated joint boards, to health service and so on and so forth. So installing handrails, ramps uh, and adapting bathrooms uh, can prevent accidents and of course stop those unscheduled hospital visits. Um, and I'll give way to Mr Scott. John Scott. I thank the Minister for giving way. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that while m not much has been made of the link between fuel poverty and mental health issues in the debate today, that this is an area where more research is needed and which could potentially bring relief to the growing mental health issues across Scotland? Kevin Stewart. Um, uh, uh, that has not really been touched on in the debate today and, uh, you know, it is an issue um, that we look at very closely. That's why uh, tackling fuel poverty um, is a priority for the government and why we'll be spending up to uh, a billion pounds to, uh, to the end of this parliament to get this right. What I would say is um, what we also require is in terms uh, beyond the energy efficiency spend and educating folk here to use um, fuel and energy more wisely. We actually need the UK government to use the powers at its disposal um, in terms of energy pricing and uh, on incomes to get this right for absolutely everyone. And if Mr. Scott wants to have further conversations with me about that, uh, how we can work together and getting the UK government to play its bit as well, I'd be more than happy uh, to do so. If I could go back to, um, to, to care and repair, you know, these are often sm a small repairs service, which is very valued by older people. Um, the trust built up and the social connection made uh, is also a, a very uh, valuable resource indeed. Uh, and this is why um, we have included an action in the strategy on continued support for the service provided by care and repair to older homeowners. And it's important that local authorities fully consider the wider benefits um, of such a service. Um, we will also continue to ask older people for their views and opinions to inform and monitor the next phase of the strategy. Um, Mr. Uh, MacDonald talked about sheltered and very sheltered housing in Aberdeen, uh, and Mr. Gibson gave uh, very good examples um, of sheltered housing and dementia-friendly housing in, in North Ayrshire. Um, and these are all good things. But when you talk to people, when you talk to people, that's not what everyone wants. Um, and I, I, if, if you, I could, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, President Officer, I, I, I'd like to go back to uh, a woman whose funeral I attended just the other week, uh, 102, uh, Mrs. Margaret Coral Marnie, uh, a well-loved uh, 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 woman in Aberdeen. Um, she stayed at home. She stayed at home with some small adaptations. Um, a woman who was very active um, until... Um, uh, the, near the very end uh, and you know I think that to allow the Mrs Corals and others of this world to make that choice to be able to live in their family home for as long as possible is what we must uh, uh, try and achieve it's okay for those folks that want sheltered housing it's okay for those folks that want very sheltered housing we can do all of that but we also must make sure 
that we provide for those folks that want to live independent lives in their own homes for as long as they possibly can. And that's why uh, we need to, to continue to listen to people. But beyond that, to get uh, to a point uh, where we are aligning all of the services to make sure that is possible. Now, in terms of our social housing program, um, uh, presiding officer, 91% of that program is uh, houses that are being delivered with, for, uh, with housing for varying need standards. Uh, that is important. That is important for the future. But many um, are not in those situations and we must look at what we can um, do for them. I realise, um, presiding officer, that I have gone well over time. Um, it is an issue that I could talk about uh, for forever and ever, to be honest with you. But in conclusion, um, I'd like to say that realising our vision for older people, um, whether in housing or other areas, uh, requires continued effort um, from government, uh, from this parliament and from other stakeholders. And we must, must ensure that older people are, are at the very centre of that effort and have the opportunity to share their concerns and aspirations for the future. Thank you, presiding officer. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.